It's time for the Kim Hammer Show, where you'll learn how your state government affects you, your family, and community. Here's Kim Hammer. Good Saturday afternoon. Hope you're having a great day. Enjoying your weekend out here in the beautiful Arkansas weather and nature. We've got a pretty good show lined up today. We've got Senator Matt Pitch, who is also making a run for the state treasurer's position here in the state of Arkansas. And then in the second half of the hour, we're going to be joined by uh, former state Senator Shane Broadway. And we're going to talk about the uh, Career Technical Education Center that's going to be opening this fall down in Saline County. Get an update on that and all the excitement built around that. But first of all, we're going to start off with uh, State Senator Matt Pitch. And Matt, thank you for joining me here on the Kim Hammer Show today. Well, thank you for the invite. Uh, do I call you Senator Hammer or Kim? I've known you so long. I, Kim's what I call people. You, you can normally. You can call me Kim. How about that? We'll, <laughs> we'll right. just spell I'll, with the I'll titles. Be you be Kim. We'll act like normal. Okay. That, that, yeah, we'll be normal uh, folks. Well, it's an honor to be with you again. I appreciate the invite. So thank you. Uh, and I know folks have, uh, that are regular listeners have heard before, but for anybody new that's joining, your geographical area is over in the Fort Smith area. Give us a geographical area where you're serving well i have the honor of serving most of fort smith but my district is the south half of fort smith greenwood hackett and bonanza i was a state rep before and i had the south and the east half of fort smith so i pretty much try and help any constituent issue throughout all of sebastian county but it's an honor it's a they're good hard working salt of the earth people and they're so far away from little rock that they tend to rely on their legislator to get their message and their their constituent services done through us. So it's a neat, neat opportunity. Cool. All right. So let's talk about uh, your history in the legislature to kind of lay the groundwork a little bit, because this is uh, this is not something that you're the new kid on the block. You've been around for a while. You and I actually served in the House together. So take us back to the beginning of when you first came into the legislative branch, number one, and then talk about some of the key legislation that you've been involved with uh, throughout the years, and I know you were chair of insurance and commerce this past session, kind of stepped up into that role, and uh, just give folks a little bit of a groundwork about your your working abilities as a senator from being able to craft and get legislation pushed through. Okay. Well, thank you for that opportunity. I started, I think, two years after you started, but we, you, as you said, we served in the House together, served on several committees, and ran a lot of bills together and a lot of issues together from the conservative side of the Republican Party. My peers elected me to be a majority leader of the House in my second term. I served four years in the House, and that was a great experience. I ran elections, two straight election cycles. Uh, The state of Arkansas was ready for conservative elections to be won by folks and was oversaw the elections that took us to 64 out of 100 Republicans and then 76 out of 100 Republicans. And the ability to go and recruit conservatives to run in the House, those who pertain, possess the intellectual capacity uh, to lead was a fun thing for me. Our Senate seat was open uh, after four years in the House and I chose to make a run for that. It was a three-way race, two former legislators who both had more years of service representing the people of Fort Smith were my two opponents, and it went to a runoff, and it was very close, but my constituents elected me to be a senator. I moved to the Senate at the same time you did, Senator Hammer, and you and I have served together. We sat right beside each other, and as far as I know, we sat beside each other the entire time. You were to my left, and now you're right behind me. So we, you and I have been in the battlefield there together as well. Uh, after my first term, I ran for and was elected the majority whip in the state Senate. Uh, that's kind of my leadership roles that I've seen. Uh, legislation, you always take pride in any kind of tax code. I was the author of one of the three tax cuts in our first couple of years. I supported all of them been pretty active in transportation issues across the state as currently the vice chairman of transportation in the Senate. Been very active in agricultural things up until this last term. I've always served on the Ag Committee and had a lot of joy in that. I I am a, a farmland owner. It just doesn't happen to be in Arkansas. It's associated with my family. My wife's a Kansas farmer's daughter and I'm from Wyoming, the grandson of 
Wyoming cattle ranchers. Um, so I've enjoyed my time and tenure on the agriculture committee. Major bills, you know, I, I, I don't care as much as you, Kim, because you're probably one of our most prolific bill carriers and getting things done and key pieces of legislation. I don't know that everybody uh, agree with you on the term prolific. I think they've used some well, other terms, but we, we keep, we're on we the air. We keep passing them, and I keep <laughs> lobbying for them, so I think it's pretty good. Yeah. Huh? Okay. Uh, Thank but you. last session was a joy for me because I wasn't in leadership, uh, not this most recent, but the first session in the Senate, and I carried 60 bills. My peers saw fit to pass, I think, 57 of them. Don't quote me on that number. It's been a year or two since then. But good good legislation, good pro-business guy, I think you'd find. Uh, my peers, as I've been campaigning statewide, have done a lot of introducing me as fiscal conservative. And I think that my record, you know, if you want to know me, there's 1,500 votes a year for the last seven years, so to speak. It's pretty easy to know who I am and where I come from as a conservative. So I think that's a pretty brief, maybe not so brief, but that's my description of my career. You know, you passed one piece of legislation, it's Act 202, to amend the laws concerning the Arkansas Economic Development Council and to, and the Arkansas Economic Development Commission. I, I know that you're interested in economic development. Uh, I would like for you to tell folks, because they may not realize it, how you support those that are entrepreneurs and wanting to go into the business um, regarding that piece of legislation, uh, I, I think it's testimony of your desire to be a driver when it comes to the economic mm -hmm. development of the state. Well, maybe it's a sign of how old I am, but I don't like to think I'm that old. But as a very young man, I wanted to add a farm to the farm operations in Kansas. And I went to the bank. I really didn't have that intention when I went to the bank with my future brother-in-law and they worked a deal where he got his first piece of property through a loan through the bank. And the banker looked at me and said, what can I do for you? And I was young and stupid, I guess. And I said, give me the same deal. And I was still in college. And he said, well, what do you do? And I knew being in college wouldn't be a good answer. So I told him I'm captain of the call on my college football team. And that didn't work so well in trying to acquire a loan to buy a farm. There wasn't a slot on the loan application for that? Yeah, it wasn't for that. So I just go figure. But that's literally the skill set I had at that, that age as a young guy. But he did call me back about 10 days later and said, you're going to get married to my wife now, 36 years. And I said, yes, this summer. And he said, you're about to be an electrical engineer, aren't you? And I said, yeah. And he said, I'll tell you what. I'll give you a signature note and you can be in the farming business. Those kind of things don't occur today. I have four children that are grown engineers and they have way more skill sets than I ever had in those days, but they couldn't get a loan if they promised to do anything and everything. With the bureaucracy, I'm not sure I qualify as a farmer for a loan with government bureaucracy like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And so you mentioned it's been my passion. I tend to take equity from the farmland that I've continued to buy from that first day to help young people. I help farmers get started in the business because they can't walk into a bank and get a signature note to get started. They need somebody to go with them and put the bankers at ease, if you will. Uh, through the years, I've owned a furniture business. I've helped a guy with a biometric gun safe business et cetera, et cetera. And at any one time, I'll own, I don't know, three to seven small businesses where I own part of it, trying to help entrepreneurs get something up and running. Because like, quite frankly, I think that's the real issue. We, we in government through the last 30, 40 years have built so much bureaucracy that a hardworking youngster, man or woman, just can't find the means to get into a business. And it's very tough for entrepreneurs. And you referenced my AEDC. I don't even remember. I guess that's a good thing, which bill that was by the numbers, because I like to think I've carried almost every AEDC bill the last couple of years when I was carrying bills, because we have got to have the next Sam Walton, the next, you know, John Tyson. We're a state that should be prolifically filled with young entrepreneurs making a, a growth position in our state. But if our bureaucracy is set to limit that, 
we're not going to see that continue as a state. So I feel passionate about that. So let me transition the conversation a little bit. You've announced that you're running for state treasurer. Um, what is it that possessed you to want to run for state treasurer and to walk away from a Senate seat? Well, I'll give you the, the easy answer to why you want the hardest job in politics. Real briefly, working on the ranch in Wyoming for my grandpa's, you were taught you have a problem, you either lean into it, and try and solve it, or you run away from it and you still have the problem. And as I look at the economy we're clearly in, and I look, I know your your listeners are probably have some angst about what what we're looking at in the way of an economy. But I'm old enough to remember the last several Democratic White Houses we've had, and I know that sounds very partisan, but the recession leading in to the well, the end of Jimmy Carter's years, the recession of 2008 to 2014, an argument could be made what causes those things. But as a straight treasurer, you are well aware our state budget is $5.84 billion. That's the state budget based on taxable revenue streams versus the services rendered. But the treasurer, the treasury in the state of Arkansas is almost 30 billion, it's 29.3 billion, I guess, to be fair. The, the money that's in our treasury are federal dollars that come into this state, oftentimes with the bureaucratic ties I was mentioning earlier, but it's important that that holds its value those things go to schools, they go to cities, they go to counties. They're federal dollars that pass through to our hospitals, et cetera, our DHS operations. And if you lose money because of a recession, lose 1% on a $30 billion treasury, that's $300 million. That's a 5% tax cut or increase, however you're gonna try and offset those services for the next legislature. So we have a real problem as the state, and as I said earlier, you can either lean into it, build a team, I'm a coach's kid, build a team that's ready to, to protect the value of that money as it's going through our treasury, or you can turn and run from it and let somebody else deal with it. So that's why I chose to run for state treasurer. So what qualifies you, though, to be the treasurer? You're a state senator, you help individuals that have entrepreneurial ambitions, um, you know, you are, of course, obviously, you, you're a businessman, but what qualifies you to be the treasurer of the state of Arkansas and to shoulder that responsibility? Well, it's interesting you, you ask that because that was the very first question the media asked. I am an electrical engineer, bachelor and master's, deal a lot with numbers. But what a lot of people don't understand is that I have a, man, uh, a management degree in addition to that from Rolla both my bachelor's and master's were electrical engineering with management. But I'm not sure if one can, I mean, scope and size of the treasurer's office. I've tried to spend an hour a week, every week with staff in the treasurer's office, trying to learn who they are and what's being done in that office. I'm not trying to assume I, I'm going to win the election or win the vote of the citizens, but I want to be educated on it. But it does more transactions than all but two banks on the planet. The skill set required to do that, in my mind, is very much like when I first became a vice president of engineering. You need expertise in all areas of fiscal management and fiscal transactions, of dispersing money and collecting money from the feds to disperse to all those entities I mentioned earlier. But what you really need is a CEO who can head that up. And since I was 32 years old, I've been a president of a company and a CEO of my own type company. Uh, I just feel like building a team of extremely qualified folks, much like when you're dealing with being the vice president of engineer, they have a very specific skill set. You put aside having to know everything and you trust those who are excellent at what they do and you put them in a place where they can, they can excel. So that's why I think I would be a fit in the treasurer's office. The investment strategies of the treasurer's office, uh, because you mentioned, you know, a 1% loss and what a hit it would be and how that would relate to uh, the ability for us as legislators to give or not be able to give a tax cut because, you know, mm -hmm. you would lose that money. Investment strategies, as you see it, what are, what's your game plan or what are your thoughts as far as how to uh, 
make the money work hard for us, but not put it at such risk that we would, you know, experience that one percent loss you mentioned. Right. That's a great question because it's a matter of your perspective. Our state treasurer and his the team they build, he or she builds, has a whole lot of shall we say guardrails. They can't invest in this because it might be too risky or it might not give it might give a great reward, but it's also too risky and we can't risk any kind of loss of money with no productivity from that money. So as I look at the state treasurer, what they can and can't invest that four and a half billion on up to whatever's there at any one time, it isn't like you and I that can go to the stock market. You know, we can't invest as a treasurer's office in even things like Bitcoin or or whatever cryptocurrency. You can't even really play the stock market. Our our current treasurer's office in their process were allowed to invest in like say commercial paper or low grade bonds. Very little risk, but very little reward. So, but that was fine because we've been in such a strong, I'll I'll call it what I think it is, Trump economy the last four to five years, that that was fine. I'm worried that it's going to take some excellent skill sets to play defense in a downturn of the economy, that I feel like we're headed into a recession with interest rates and the price of wood, steel, et cetera, grocery bills, gas bills, you name it. And so... My perspective on the outside looking in, I'm very happy with where the barriers are. My perspective of being a state treasurer with those barriers, those are the rules. We're going to live with them, but we have to be extremely intellectual in when we purchase and when we sell and when we trade and how we trade to keep the value of the taxpayer monies coming from the federal government, our treasury, from losing their value. So... I think I like the rules we've got in place. I don't anticipate coming to the legislature asking for a loosening of what we can and can't invest. But at some level, recessions cause you to do a lot of things. And my conservative nature, I'm a tightwad by nature. You know me, Kim, pretty well. That my nature is we don't need to do risky things when we're, when we're in a recession. We need to do common sense, meat and potato, blocking and tackling type stuff. From time from time to time, there's legislation that comes across for discussion um, that would put the treasury in a competitive nature against the private sector. Your mm-hmm. view and your position on that, because you know one of the challenges as a legislator is we want to see that money working as hard as we can because the more the treasury makes, the greater the opportunity to be less dependent upon raising the annual budget in order to accommodate the needs of the agencies, Mm -hmm. but also if the treasury is growing at a healthy rate and we're accumulating wealth, for lack of a better term, uh, it gives us a greater possibility to give tax cuts and and do other things that all conservatives ought to embrace. But what's the balance that you see if you're elected as treasurer between growing that treasury account to as healthy a balance as you can but not stepping over the line competing against the private sector or are all bets off and everything's fair game in the money world well as you said republican conservatives believe in tax cuts value of money you and i are both champions i feel like in that realm we need to without fail also try to limit government So I'm going to say that statement first. It's not our role to be in industries where we're growing government. It's our role to get government out of it and let the free market play where it wants to play. But I'm a businessman. And there are certain things in business that we aren't going to participate in because a business is in business to make money. And if they don't play and it causes our society to have issues – Then the legislature, that's the fine razor blade edge decision making that the legislature has to deal with is does government want to take care of that subset of folks and can they do it at the limited, most smallest version of government that's possible? Because if they don't, it's going to hit government right between the teeth 
when said population gets to be an eater, older population that does then require support from all our social programs once they've retired, et cetera. So there's different types of answers to that question you just asked. If you go with the principles that we have limited government, we want to have maximum results on our investment so we can, A, reduce taxes, B, if we need to, provide a better service for the same tax amount or lower tax amount, then that's what I see as the role of the Treasury. So, Okay. The Do you see ways that as the uh, – if you're elected as Treasurer – are there are there things that you see that you can improve on? And that's not a criticism against the current treasurer because he's done a great job as far as managing the wealth of the state. And and you know we haven't even ventured off into that conversation about the the financial stability of the state improves our ability to be competitive on other areas such as being able to get lower bond ratings for the you know projects that we are going. Uh, and and I think we at this moment are financially positioned well. But do you see areas that you would want to go in and immediately begin to make some changes to what you think uh, could possibly be able to take it to the next level? Every treasurer will be evaluated based upon their results. And I've told Treasurer Milligan, our current treasurer, that he might go down as the greatest treasurer in the history of Arkansas because his results are going to be tied to an economy that's been on roar mode. I mean, if you want indices to reflect what kind of economy we've just left, I mean, Dow was 14,500 14, as an indice when Treasurer Milligan took over. It's now 34,000. Well, his results are going to reflect an economy that's two and a half times bigger, roaring, if you will, than when he took over. Now, they've done a lot of good things. Your question is, would I go in there and change a bunch? The answer is... You about have to, because the economy I'm going to see if the citizens choose to elect me here next next fall, November of next year, it won't be that positive roaring economy if my estimates are right. I think we're headed into that recession I was defining earlier, and not necessarily talking about personnel changes, but policy changes. There's a whole different game. I'm a coach's kid. There's a whole different game if your team – all about offense because you have great players on offense and you're better than the opposition as opposed to coaching a team that has to play defense. Those are different policies. You've got to be able to deal with whatever the, the industry, the, the economy gives you in this office. It's a very dynamic, constantly changing situation. So right. I, I don't have specifics to, to say there other than at a 10,000 foot view, I foresee this job's going to have to play defense at least till we get to the next presidential election. Okay. Let me ask you, and this is legislator to legislator, which I think, you know, proves or provides some insight as to your thought processes and, and who you are. We as a state right now are sitting on a one plus billion dollar surplus. Potentially that could even grow more just depending on how things play out with the federal money that's coming into the state, the spinoff of, uh, the, uh, the benefits of that, which are not going to be long-term sustaining. It's going to begin to curve down at some point whenever they quit giving away this free money, which money's never free. Somebody pays for it eventually. But with us sitting where we are, um, you know, every, people have the tendency to want to think that they see a big pot of money sitting out there, and that's our money, and we ought to get it back, which I agree. But that money has also come as a result of some false stimulators that have helped create that your view as a legislator of the one point plus billion dollars that we have and how do we need to make that work for the best long-term benefits of the citizens? I think that's a question that's answered in about three phases. So let me start with the first phase. The day I walked into the legislature was the same day our governor stepped in. You had the opportunity to serve one term before but if you'll remember, when, when when we came in, there was zero savings account. And the fiscal conservative in me looked at our state. We would balance X, we would spend X, and we'd have nothing left. And the outside world looked at us as unfiscally sound. We were a double-A bond rating. 
and potentially should have been maybe lower without any kind of reserves. And so we set about doing policy, finding finding projects, scavenging through state agencies was the largest part of it. And we built that up to about 200, I think we were 209 million coming into this last session. So now I'm going to move into the second phase of that answer. Tell you what, reference the, hey, I, I'm going to hit break? the, yeah, I'm going to hit the pause button because Heidi is giving me that look. Okay. okay. So Let's you get ready, you, you come back with two and three and we're going to be joined by Shane Broadway uh, when we come back and we're going to tie into a three-way conversation. Then I'm going to transition awesome. to. Uh, him talking about another subject matter, but can you hang on through the break, Matt? I'll do it. I'm All right. here. Very good. Thank you for listening to the Kim Hammer Show. You can go up to my website, www.thekimhammershow.com, and be kept informed with all the current things that are going on and some other good conservative tidbits as well. So come back and listen to the Kim Hammer Show after the break. Welcome back to the Kim Hammer Show here on 101.1 FM, The Answer. Thank you for joining us on a uh, beautiful Saturday afternoon here in the state of Arkansas. My guests today are Senator Matt Pitch, uh, who I serve with in the Senate, but also he is a candidate for the treasurer of the state of Arkansas. And now we're going to also be joined by uh, former state Senator Shane Broadway. And uh, we're going to talk about the Career Technical Education Center down in Saline County that's going to be opening up here this fall in just a little bit. So thank you all for being on the Kim Hammer Show. Matt, let me pick back up with you because you were giving us, uh, you gave us the first of a three-part answer. And the question was, with a one-point-plus billion dollar survey uh, or surplus in the state budget, what is your view as far as how that ought to be managed to the long-term benefit of our Kansans? Go ahead and pick up on your second answer there. I'll, I'll be real quick. First, I want to say hello to Shane. Good friend. Great hey, Senator, how are you? The people very well of this state. I'm good. And you? Well, you're very kind. I'm great. I'm great. Okay. Thank you. You're very kind. Good to hear from you. Right. You too. Uh, real quick, second phase of that is this session with all of the money coming from Stimulus and CARES Act, we as the legislator said, no, don't let that disappear. And Kim, you and I were leading that charge with many of our colleagues. We grabbed that. We put it in a box, if you will. We said, we've got to get to a point where the bond rating on this 24, 25 billion, that's almost 30 billion with our state revenues is protected in the case of a recession. So we left assembly thinking we'd put 711 million into that, which would change our bond rating from a double A to a triple A and made us a fiscally sound state. It also gave us a savings account. You know, those of your listeners who listen to Dave Ramsey, we were starting to live like grandma. We had a savings account. We weren't waking up every day worried about whether our state's unsound. And so, lo and behold, even more funds come into the state, through CARES Act, PPP, PUP, whatever means the federal government is throwing it. It's coming into the state, and we are seeing people buy things, thus filling up the coffers. So now the third phase of that, and I was visiting with some people, banker out of South Arkansas, and he had a great analogy, and I hope it fits with your, your members, that if you won the lottery on a scratch-off ticket that gave you 20 bucks, would you go change how you lived your life? Well, probably not. So we have money coming in. It's not winning the entire lottery, but it's you found some money. Does that mean you change everything about how you've been fiscally responsible and watching your budget on a day-to-day -day basis? I hope not, because that will put you and your state back at risk. So what I want to do is get this, this savings account set up. Then we in the legislature need to analyze tax cuts. We need to analyze services. I think we're going to talk with Shane here in a minute about a great opportunity to develop our Kansans through educational processes. Where can we best use that money? Is it give it back? Is it tax cuts? Is it do better services? That's why we elect people to come to the legislature. And those are the three phases to that question. So now I'll shut up. Well, let me, let me chime in on that. And then if you can hang on, because what is happening down at the Career Technical Education Center in Sling County 
ties in with your passion for yep. uh, education and also career preparation. So if you want to hang on, hang on, but I know you got a busy schedule. No, no, I'll, I'll be glad to listen in. All Always right. when you can learn something. So here's my position on the one point plus billion dollars. Uh, we have been blessed to get where we are. And you mentioned about the AAA bond rating. And Shane, you go back a long way. You were a former Speaker of the House and moved into the Senate. Um, so you've you've got some history as far as seeing the economic swings within the state. Uh, before I give my answer, though, Matt, talk about the importance of that AAA or Shane chime in. Talk about the importance of that AAA bond rating and how that benefits the average Arkansan or some of the things that happen in the state of Arkansas when we want to do projects for Arkansans. I'm going to start with you, Matt, and then defer to Shane, and then I'll come back up and give you my answer. We talked earlier that the treasurer's office loses 1%. It costs 5% in the tax cut or a 5% cut in services. So going from a double A to a triple A, the interest we pay on federal pass-through dollars directly affects the services that we can give our citizens, whether it's educational opportunities like Shane's going to talk about, whether it's better roads, et cetera, all of those things that government should, by constitutional, do. But money and taxpayer dollars need to be treated like, with, I don't even know how to describe it. I'm right now clenching my hands like I'm holding a baby. It needs to be hugged, loved, caressed, and made to be the most strongest it can be. And to me, that's the, the passion we have to have as we protect our citizens and the tax dollars that come through our governments. So, Chain. Well, I, I sincerely agree with both of you. Uh, having been through now well, two recessions and then two upswings where we ended up with a, a major surplus, but ended up having to spend a lot of it on the Lakeview lawsuit and, and building school facilities throughout the states where a lot of that had to be put into. But having the ability to make some decisions and take your time in making those decisions about what Senator Pitch was talking about, which route do you go, what's best, and having that bond rating is huge, especially now that I'm in, in higher education and haven't worked in school facilities. Arkansas has always been a very capital-poor state, and so anytime we've had to build anything or need to build anything, most of that's had to go through bonding. And so when your bond rating is at the level you guys are talking about, that's huge in terms of the rate that we would get if we need to build a new building because enrollment's up or you've got a building that's going, you know, out of its usage or highways, school facility, anything like that that requires capital investment. When you do that, that bond rating saves a tremendous amount of money. Uh, to the taxpayer that they won't be paying an interest on that construction. That's the a, a real tangible benefit I think people can see. Which, if we do that, then that savings that we create by having the better bond rating, we can redirect toward something else, meeting whatever need is identified and that we as a legislative branch feel is important. So we're either going to pay this entity over here through a lower bond rating or we're going to save through a higher bond rating, and that creates the savings that we can use to help meet other needs. Is that a is that an accurate depiction of what we're yeah. talking about? I think it is. But all right, well, let me go ahead, Matt. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to add. Not only do we need to just focus on doing other things, as you are referencing, it may be a case where the legislature makes the decision. That's the nexus for a tax cut. That's the nexus for return it to the taxpayers. We need our intellectual capacity type legislators to say, okay, we have our money going farther because of a better bond rating. What do we do with that? How does it best benefit this state? So let me give you a comparison. And if it's accurate, that's great. If it's not accurate, you know, call me out on the radio and I'll just suck it up and deal with it. <laughs> um, it's just like a person with their individual credit score. If if they are not fiscally responsible and as a result of it, their debt to income gets greater, they fall behind on their payments, it, it not only prohibits them from being able to do what they want to do once they recognize that the error of their way, but it also ends up costing them more when they do go out and borrow the money and they have to pay a higher interest rate because they're a higher credit risk to the people that have the money to loan it. 
And until you get that credit score up as a personal individual and you prove that you are credit worthy, you don't get the benefit of the lower interest rates, but you then begin to get the benefit of being able to borrow the money and work your money harder by not having to pay as high of an interest rate. Is that a, for the average citizen that deals with credit scores and those kind of things, is that a fair example of how the bond rating and us having it higher is working to our benefit as well? That's a great example. Yeah, I think that's spot on. And I would also say that not only is what you said spot on, but now you have a billion dollars sitting over here in case we go into full recession, and we've got to get through that. Uh, Senator Broadway made a great analogy there with the Lakeview lawsuit. There's been another time in this state where they had that kind of money, and a crisis came, and we could get through that crisis because we had developed a savings account. Having a savings account has two purposes. It protects you from disasters, but it also gets you that bond rate so your projects and your taxpayer dollars go further. Okay. Well, exactly. and, and, and here's my position on the billion-plus dollar surplus. Um, when I pastored uh, or I was administrator, associate pastor down at Hall Chapel in Benton, we had a church member, and we were debating building a family life center, and we were having the typical Baptist business meeting. Everybody was putting their thoughts on the table, and <laughs> we were trying to find our way through to the answer, you know, the Lord wanted us to have. And this old gentleman, a scholarly old gentleman, stood up in the back, and he made this statement. He said, leave the woodpile higher than you found it. Well, in order to leave the woodpile higher than you found it, you got to have the resources to be able to do that, and you want to leave it better for the next generation my position on the one plus billion dollars is that we preserve that and we have reached that point. And I think it's seven or eight percent. Matt, you can straighten me out or Shane. Seems like it's around uh, one point two billion, one point two five billion represents about seven or eight percent of the budget, which will allow us mm -hmm. to keep that triple A bond rating once we get there. So that really is the, so that money does. We need to treat that money like it doesn't exist. And then we address issues going forward, capitalizing on the rest of this tidal wave that we're getting, uh, continue to be good conservatives in the practice of the budget, and use that money going forward above that 1.25 uh, to be able to meet the other needs that are out there. We've got teachers who are wanting help on their insurance, state employees wanting help on their insurance. we got highway infrastructure and all those other things that we can address. But if we don't keep that $1.25 billion, our goal set aside and safe, it's going to end up costing us in the long run. Now, you guys are welcome to respond to that or, you know, shoot that theory full of holes if you want to. Uh, but that would be my position as a legislator, how we treat it. I'll let Shane go first on that, but I do uh, have a comment to that. Go ahead, Shane. No, I, I think it's an excellent commentary uh, in terms of, of how you prioritize and how you, how you deal in these kind of situations because, like Senator Pitt said, you never know – What's around the corner? I mean, everybody's kind of, you've had all this federal money out there for the past year because of COVID. When that starts to go away, what does your economy really look like? Um, and so I think it's it's wise to be prudent and judicious and, and kind of deciding what you guys uh, feel is best and right, you know, going forward and take your time. you got the luxury of taking time. Not every state does. Um, you know, we're having the... The requirement of revenue stabilization has, has saved Arkansas many, many times through the years mm -hmm. and having the requirement of a, a balanced budget and following that. You know, there's a lot of states who say they have to balance their budget. They just never do it. Uh, but we, Arkansas, has always kept to that. Uh, and it's, it's you know, makes, makes significant uh, things allowed to, to be able to happen because of it. I would add one thing to your list of, uh, and it's kind of the topic we're going to talk about in Senator Pitch has been involved in helping to create the one in western Arkansas, and that is uh, workforce training. Um, we still have the same amount of dollars going into workforce training in secondary career centers as the $20 million that Senator Bisbee and I put back in 2003, uh, and it's 2021, and those dollars are thinner and thinner. But those investments into programs that are going to lead to a job are certainly worth consideration, I think, uh, going forward. I would, I would call, uh, first of all, I'd say absolutely on the workforce training, but I would go back to your 7%. Uh, 
you know, and you're, you brought up biblical, I'm chairman of my congregation. Our emergency right now is our air conditioner quit. Well, thank goodness, about four years ago when I took over as chairman of the congregation, we started building a savings account for that exact situation. And that's what the state needs to do and realize these funds are. Now, how much is the right number is kind of what is at the heart of your question. Again, I kind of go to biblical. I want 10 percent. I, I want 10 percent of our budget sitting there because we're taught about a tithe. The good Lord will will bless you if you tithe. And that will be paid back many times. And I, I guess at some level, I don't know what's the right number to have in in the savings account, the long-term reserve, but you need one. And it's a whole lot more than the zero. And where it is right now, if you take our budget and divide it by 12 months, we got about a little over a month and a half sitting there in case the heater and the air conditioner unit goes bad, so to speak. For the state. So it's absolutely critical that we have it. I don't know if that's the right level. I mean, it'll it'll equalize itself out with time. What's the right number? But we've got some real needs in the state. And I think workforce training, as Shane mentioned, is my passion. And I love what you're doing in Saline County. We've tried to do that in Fort Smith. We're into phase two. We're we're developing a new building with Peak Innovation Center, is what it's called, where local industries are investing heavily to be able to train our young people, you know, you're not going to be able to find a plumber or an electrician in the next 20 years because we aren't trained. Exactly. Enough. So, well, then, throw, anyway. yeah, throw in the issues of society that nobody wants to get out to work. However, I did read the article, I think it was yesterday, since the legislature and the governor backed each other up by saying that we're going to uh, cut off that $300, I did notice that people are getting out looking for jobs more now. So the strategy worked as far as getting people uh, motivated to get out and find a job before that $300 goes away. All right, we got about 10 minutes left, so let's transition a little bit. Uh, Shane, let's talk about the Career Technical Education Center down in Saline County. It's going to be opening up this fall. And by the way, just a side note, did I see that you received or somebody made a scholarship or established an endowment of a scholarship in your name, or am I making that up? No, you're not making that up. It was very, very kind. Uh, fellow Saline County, in the uh, name of Ed Vance and his company, he owns a company in Little Rock uh, and a company in Searcy, and they had approached ASUBB about establishing a scholarship and wanted to do it in, in my name, and I was deeply honored and uh, to do that. It's for a student in our nursing program at ASU Searcy, a single parent, uh, always a passion of mine, has been non-traditional students. And uh, so very grateful for them to, uh, to do that. It'll it'll change a life, and that's uh, that's what it's all about. Well, congratulations. Ed is a good guy. We worked together this past session on some legislation, and uh, he is a good guy, and, and uh, congratulations on that honor. Well, thank you. Okay, so the center's opening up this fall, correct? We're on track to get it August. open? Yeah, August 16th, we should get a key, uh, hopefully this week or next. Uh, they're about done with the construction part. Then Scott Kootenkuhler, who is our assistant vice chancellor, who will be overseeing a assistant vice chancellor at ASU Three Rivers, he'll be uh, over the Sling County Career and Technical Campus uh, this fall and been working really hard in the last few months since he came on board. Uh, they'll start moving in furniture and equipment. Uh, Center Pitch knows that well. When, you, when you're starting something like this, there's a lot of new equipment that has to go in. We're going to have 10, 10 programs starting August 16th and over 500 students in the first year. It can obviously, you want to start smaller in the first year. You've got students coming from six school districts, Benton, Bryant, Boxite, Harmony Grove, Glen Rose, and Sheridan. And they will start to filter in then, and uh, but hopefully next year we'll be able to double that. And our hope is to also have in the future night and weekend courses through ASU Three Rivers at the center because obviously there's some times that it won't be used for high school students. But first off is going to be the focus on the technical programs for the high school students. And I'll I wrote down the list so I made sure I had it right. Uh, and this is. You've been involved with this since day one, Senator Hammer, and you've been very supportive, and we appreciate you for your leadership uh, and guidance in a lot of different ways, especially in dealing with the General Assembly on this. And so, but these programs we're going to have came about from discussions with business and industry in Sling County. So these are industry-driven programs. We're, these are not ones we just 
picked out of thin air. So uh, the 10, and I think this is 10, my, I wasn't a math major, uh, is automotive technology, construction, cybersecurity, health sciences, HVAC and refrigeration, industrial tech, manufacturing, CNA, medical professions, networking, and welding. And so those have been identified by our partners in industry. And uh, we noticed a few years ago, you'll remember this, uh, out of those six schools, there's about 500 kids every year who graduate who do not enroll in college somewhere the next fall, a two-year or four-year college. And it's really targeted at these kids to give them something while they're in high school that can help them to go out, either go on to college uh, and further their education or go out and then be able to get a job right out of high school that's going to pay them a good wage. And so we're excited about it. Uh, it's going to be a great thing for Saline County. And like I said, your leadership has been critical in getting us to this point. The 10 programs, all those that you mentioned, uh, are highly sought after right now as far as employers looking for employees the center and Matt, your center over there in Fort Smith, uh, easily adaptable that if an industry wanted to come into a location, because that's one of the discussions, you know, you need a, you need an industrial site that is, that is shovel ready as they use the phrase, but you also have to be able to get that workforce quickly trained in whatever is going to be the need of that manufacturer that's wanting to come in. So as far as adaptability, Matt, is your facility over there adaptable that if a plant wanted to come in or Shane, the same thing with ours down there? Well, you have to be dynamic. And I know your facility from what little <clears throat> I've talked with folks there is much like ours. You've got an industry advisory board and I served six years as the Dean at UA Ar University of Arkansas, Fort Smith and our WOTC program, which is the equivalent of what you're talking there. We would oftentimes have people walk in and say, our industry can't find X. And I remember one specific, and the chain hit on this too, the cost to get into these industries is huge. But what they needed were diesel mechanics. We're located in the middle of trucking companies. And there's less than a handful of diesel mechanics in the entire state. And yet we're a trucking haven we're driving diesel trucks. So if you aren't setting it up to be relative for that, it's a dynamic situation, constantly changing, and your industry advisory boards will feed you what they need for employees. So, Shane, anything to add? He, he nailed it on the head. I mean, that's the key. Is where, and that's where, you know, I, I work with both four-year and two-year colleges. And Matt Center was, you know, WOTC and UFAS was a two-year West Ark and transitioned to four-year, but still kept their two-year programs. Two-year institutions are, are a lot more nimble and flexible and can be because that's the way they're established and set up. And so you've got to be, if we've got a, a prospect coming into town, say Coors Tech is going to do an expansion like they've already done, they want to be partners, they want us to help train their workers, we can make it happen. You know, And that's what you've got to do or else you, you're, you're not relevant uh, to the business and industry you're supposed to serve. So um, that's what we look forward to doing. And and, and partners who've come to say, hey, can we, we want to talk to you. Uh, and so we'll find a way to make it happen. All right. I'm down to like two or three minutes. So give us the nuts and bolts of the facility, Shane. Square footage, dollar cost. Um, I know that was done with the tax passed by the people. Uh, estimated payoff time. Give us the uh, nuts and bolts in a minute. Yeah, it's about 135,000 square foot facility. It's huge. Uh, it's on about, uh, we have 27 acres total. I think 22 of that is uh, being developed, so we've got room to expand. Benton School District's actually going to start building an elementary school back behind the, uh, the facility. Uh, but it was a uh, tax uh, passed by the, the voters of Saline County and has a payback of about 12 years was the estimate, but Saline County's never had a sales tax, and so you, it was an estimate, and we think that's going to be an earlier payoff uh, of the bond. So you're talking about about a $43 million all total. Uh, the facility itself around 30 plus equipment, uh, F, as we call it, FF&E, furniture, fixtures, uh, and equipment. And uh, so it's uh, we're ready to go. Hopefully going to have a grand opening the, the second week of August before school starts. And I uh, hope everybody comes out and takes a look and, and uh, becomes a part of the center. We think it's going to be something great for Saline County for many, many years to come. 
Well, if we can just get I-30 finished before the second week of August, it'll make it a lot better. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> you know, the price of progress, that's all I can say about that one. I mean, it's, it is, it is, you just have to endure the moment to get the benefits down the road. So that's all Amen I got to say about to that. that. Yep. All right, Matt, I'm down like a minute and a half. Let me give you any parting words you want to share there. I, I just really appreciate the time I got to spend with you gentlemen. It was very intriguing to me. You know, I the one thought that comes up since we're still in chains segment is the two great communities that we're talking about that you represent and I represent. They're taking a, they're taking the future and and making it happen through entities like what Shane's doing. Think about the rest of our state though. It's important, you know, that we bring like I think we bring 20 some schools into ours and I, I enjoy chain listing all the schools and yours but we're a big state and we need to replicate it five more times around the state okay. we need everybody getting this so thanks right. for the opportunity today though all right and you can go up to uh, pitch for arkansas is matt's website pitch for arkansas and learn more about him i'm down to like 45 seconds shane you get 15 of it any parting words well, I just pre appreciate Center Pitch, and, and we've learned a lot from what they've done uh, over in Fort Smith and tried to take that and apply that to this new center in Saline County. So uh, we're excited about the next couple of months. The staff will begin working uh, the middle of July. They'll start going to training, and we'll start loading in. I think it's probably going to be the most toured facility uh, in the next year. Very good. Uh, I think we give a tour about two times a day. So All right. Watch appreciate you. Uh... Watch Kim Hammer Show website. We'll have information up. We want everybody to come see it and duplicate it. You've been listening to Kim Hammer Show. Thank you for listening. Had Matt Pitch, Senator on, as well as Shane Broadway. Thank you all for taking time to join me here on the Kim Hammer Show. <laughs>